everyone's trying to, you know, live longer and live more healthy and live a long life and not show it. And, you know, there's a lot of interventions that you could do to correct that. But there's also a lot of just self-care that you can do to manage that as well. And so the Taoist masters say that if you live in balance with nature and in moderation, that you can have longevity in your life. Podcasting from the base of Lake Tahoe in the Eastern Sierras comes the Medicine Wheel. We are a group of progressive physicians seeking solutions and enlightenment while surfing the seas of big data and summiting mountains of research in an effort to make the practice of medicine more personal and medical knowledge more accessible and empower you, the listener, to be as healthy as possible. Now, the medicine wheel. Uh, good afternoon, this is Dr. Floyd and Dr. Sean Devlin of The Medicine Wheel. We have a special guest, Melinda Choi, joining us today from South Lake Tahoe. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you for being here today. Thank you so much. I appreciate the invitation. My pleasure. Melinda Choi is a uh, graduate from Five Branches University in Santa Cruz, California in 2003, and then she received a master's degree in traditional Chinese medicine. She has also studied at Zhejiang University in China, and she is a licensed acupuncturist in California and holds a national certification in acupuncture and Chinese herbology. Uh, Melinda opened Elevate Wellness in South Lake Tahoe in 2004, and I was uh, luckily enlightened to her presence in our area by Dr. Mackey, who we've had on our show uh, previously, and it's a great podcast. If you haven't seen it, I highly recommend watching it. Um, she recommended Dr. Uh, Melinda for a very uh, difficult and perplexing case, and I was very happy to send this patient up to her. Um, Dr. Troy, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. Excellent. Um, why don't you go ahead and tell us just a little bit about yourself and how you ended up in the field of medicine, because it's kind of a roundabout sort of way. It really is. I mean, I think that... Uh, so my background on my path is that I've always just been really passionate about looking at the functions of the world. I mean, I was really enlightened of like the civil rights movement and I just felt a strong connection to that and just looking at humanity and human rights and um, I kind of started feel that started fueling probably in high school and then as I moved on I became more exposed to politics and the political process and so I had an opportunity to work with a um, local congressman who was a co-chairman of the human rights caucus and I did that in my and when I was in community college, when I was at home with my parents for the first two years after high school. And then I was able to move on and um, go into, went to UCSB and I got a degree in political science and a minor in global peace and security. And I was all ready to take on the world and had my dream internship at, with Amnesty International and in the interest of doing human rights work in Asia. And my mom was sick. And so I was in my senior year of college, and she had been fighting cancer um, since I was 17 years old. Um, to add to that, my father was also disabled, and so he had been disabled from an accident that kind of started him on a cycle of multiple surgeries when I was 12 years old. So I was often in and out of hospitals and rehab centers and with conventional medicine, and I was with my mom a lot during her appointments and undergoing her cancer treatments. And uh, when I was when I flew back to DC, I was there for about five days, and my sister called me and she said, "Mom's dying, and you need to come home." And so I quickly, you know, booked the next flight out and left early the next morning, thinking that I wasn't going to get there on time to be able to be with her when she passed. And uh, luckily, I got there on time. And when I showed up, it was really interesting. She, my sister had warned me and she said, you know, the cancer had spread to her liver and she looked very jaundiced. And so she said, you know, mom doesn't look very clear. She's very jaundiced. So I just want to make sure that you, you know that and you're prepared for when you come and see her at the hospital. And I walked in and my mom was rosy cheeked and really bright eyed. And she had so much clarity in the way that she looked. 
And she, I was so happy to see her. She was happy to see me. And I just like, I couldn't believe she was, they were giving her that prognosis that she was dying. And I, and I looked at my sister and I said, what are you talking about? Mom looks amazing. And my sister looked and she, t- she said, oh my gosh, she does. She looks amazing. And she said, you know, there is this Qigong master who had just come from, uh, he, <laughs> the funny thing is he was a Qigong master who was a pilot on China Airlines. So a lot of Chi- Chinese people all kind of know each other, <laughs> even though you have a <laughs> country of billions of people right. and lots of immigrants. And so she, um, she had had this connection where this uh, master was able to come and treat her. In the hospital? In the hospital. I don't think they actually told anyone that he was going to come and treat her, but I had just missed him. He had just left. And so that's why she looked like that after her after her session with him and unfortunately he left and he flew back to china and uh, you know was just had a few a little bit of time to be able to see her um but needless to say a few days later she did pass away and that really turned my life upside down and i went back to school a few days later literally a few days later after watching my mom die um that was my first real experience up close with death and uh, went back to finish my senior year in college because my parents had wanted me to, and that's how they taught us is to be functional, set emotions aside, and to just charge on. And so I did. And you know, being in school, I knew that I was highly traumatized and really had to take a step back and find a way of being able to heal and really work with my emotions and the trauma that was experienced. And so that was my first exposure to therapy. And that was counseling services. And it would really benefit me at that time. But graduating from school, I did not know what I was going to do. But it really set me on this path of just soul searching and looking and seeing what what is my purpose here. And my greater purpose has now been diminished because it went from saving and working with thousands and millions potentially of lives to looking at the outcome of my mother and and medicine and it really again like made me think a lot about mind body medicine and what her journey was like through uh, through her treatment with oncology and I think in talking to you Dr. Devlin that that when I asked you about it earlier you had said you know oncology is very interesting because it's the only medicine that takes the human constitution out of it that it's and that's exactly what I saw with my mom is that she didn't have there was no space for her to heal. It was very much like let's attack and kill the disease like it's some other entity outside of her, but it completely left outside the fact that she didn't have a place in her nervous system to be able to heal. She was not in a good place for her and in her mental state. And she had been traumatized most of her life. And all these things kind of started coming out slowly as she was dying, where she would reveal these, these um, traumas. You know, she had lived a very hard life. They were, my, both my parents were immigrants. And uh, they all started coming out in the end, which I think I find that very interesting. So it's kind of a long story, but I just kind of ebb and flow through, you know, reading a lot, learning about Deepak Chopra and he, learning about mind-body healing and then finding that I wanted to really do a couple of different, work with people in different ways. And that was through the mental and emotional aspect and then also the physical medicine side of things. I knew I didn't want to be a physician, but I didn't know exactly what arena. And so someone has said to me, you should be an acupuncturist. And my first response was, Oh, I hate needles. There's no way I would ever do that. (laughs) And then once I looked into it more, um, I realized that it is the perfect medicine for me. I think coming from the background that uh, being raised by an immigrant family from China and with my grandmother involved and that it was very much integrated in just the way that I was brought up, number one. And then number two of that, in the way the Chinese medicine approach is very much in mind, body, and spirit. And so you're really looking at the whole person, their personality, their constitution, their past traumas, and then their physical manifestations of those ailments. That's really a physical manifestation of where the emotional place is. 
And then, uh, and, you know, I really love that physical mind, that physical aspect of it, that we are, we do have a physical component of the medicine that allows the body to promote healing and to heal itself and to move beyond these places without having to do any sort of interventions early on. So it's very much about holding space and allowing a patient's body to do what it's meant to do, but just giving it that opportunity. So that's how I kind of came around this long-winded journey. <laughs> and ultimately, people find it funny because they say, oh, you know, you really moved away from politics. And that's a really big shift for you. And I said, no, it's absolutely not at all. Healthcare is incredibly political. And what I saw is that people cannot make good political judgment around having compassion for others or the environment because they're so out of their own bodies and that they have no ability. If they can put junk food in their bodies and treat their body like crap, they can also just throw garbage out the window because they're also putting garbage inside their body. There's zero connection with that. So in a way, I'm still in politics because I still believe, have all the same values and ethical stances, but in a way I'm working with it one-on-one -on -one with a patient so I can enlighten them and say, hey, you know what? You treat your body well, and you're also going to respect the environment, and then you're also going to respect the person next to you. So, and this is my roundabout way of still doing politics. <laughs> That's a good way to do politics. <laughs> yeah, for sure, one-on-one. -on -one. Um, you have brought up some uh, really interesting points. I think for our listeners and our viewers, it might be helpful to talk a little bit about acupuncture because I think if no one's ever experienced it or gone to an acupuncturist to mm -hmm. train like yourself, mm -hmm. um, they might not know what it's all about. But maybe you can give a little background about um, what it is, how it works, why it works. Right. So acupuncture is a component of traditional Chinese medicine. And traditional Chinese medicine is really rooted in Taoism. And Taoism not, isn't necessarily a religion. It's more of a belief system in the way that you view uh, your relationship to nature. And so Taoism Dao, is really about looking at that we are a component of nature. So everything that you see within the natural world is also happening within our bodies. So within those, within the framework of that, traditional Chinese medicine is broken down into acupuncture, traditional Chinese herbology, traditional Chinese uh, dietetics, and then you're also looking at some bodywork components. And those bodywork components can be gua sha or scraping. And then now I think a lot of PTs, I can't remember the other terms that they're using, but I think a lot of other modalities are now taking in this kind of gua sha scraping technique. Cupping has become very popularized as well. And then um, you, ha so it's really a, a process of all four of those. And so when you're looking at training that in the States, oftentimes we're trained and most, most people who are trained in California are trained in all four of those modalities within the traditional Chinese medicine scope. Uh, whereas in other states, you may only be trained in acupuncture alone. A lot of physicians who are trained in acupuncture are only trained in acupuncture, so the technique of just placing the needles into the body. And then uh, same thing with, I think, dry needling is also becoming very popular. They're calling it something else, so they may not necessarily say it's acupuncture, but they're using a lot of the same components of acupuncture in their techniques. Um, so when we're looking at... In California, in the way that I was trained, we're, we're looking at all of those components of the medicine. Gotcha. Yeah. Now, within the field of the physical aspect of placing these needles, yeah. um, you, you work with the body's inherent ability to move energy around and ultimately heal, self-regulate, mm -hmm. you know, represent some level of um, homeostatic balance. Can you yeah. talk a little bit about some of the things that you work on specifically with your patients for them? Uh, in terms of uh, diseases or It could conditions. be diseases, conditions, yeah, just so mm -hmm. people can have reference, because I, I know I've had it for everything from knee pain to nausea, right. So, and it's been very effective. So I, I right. think understanding the the mechanisms is somewhat yeah. helpful. Yeah. So I, I love doing a lot of public speaking, and I've taught a lot of classes, and, and then you have the people who just call on the phone, and they're just asking, what can acupuncture treat? And we say, and this is how I train my front desk, everything. 
So they ask, oh, well, can it treat this? Just say yes. It can treat this. Just say yes. Can it treat cancer? You have to say no. That is the one thing you have to say no to. But can it treat the side effects of cancer? Absolutely. So within our scope of practice in California, we are primary care physicians. So we can treat and we're licensed to be able to uh, diagnose and manage various conditions. And so I've seen from musculoskeletal injuries all the way to autoimmunity, chronic disease, to gastrointestinal issues. And I think the one foundation of, that we can say that connects everything is our nervous system. And so we want to, you know, oftentimes we try to make Chinese medicine so esoteric. And it's a, it's a language that's kind of lost, so it becomes esoteric, but really it's a biomedicine. So we're just trying to find the right language of being able to explain how this actually works. And so what they're they're still discovering how it works. The idea, some of the ideas are that is that it helps by, you know, when you put the needles in that we're making contact. So the traditional idea is that we're making contact with the acupuncture points along the acupuncture meridians. Now the the translation of meridians was basically made from a French I think a French foreigner who went to go visit China. And so then they take these Chinese texts and then they just try their best in being able to translate it. And so he just, you know, they call them meridians. And then, you know, you make up the word chi and that chi actually just means energy center. But really, what it, what is it that we're really trying to say? And what is it that they were really trying to say? And they're not really trying to say anything different and making up, making believe that we have these meridians. So you're trying to cut open the body and look for these meridians. But we're looking for these pathways and these electrical pathways, which are all connected within our uh, neurological, cardiovascular, lymph, and, um, and you know, you're looking at the connective tissue. So you're looking at all these pathways that all connect within our nervous system too, right? So when you're putting in a point in a, a needle into that area, that acupuncture point, am I putting it into a nerve? No, because that would hurt, right? You don't want me putting a needle in your nerve. Am I putting it into your vascular system? Probably not, because then it's going to cause a hematoma. And often, uh, oftentimes that does happen. That doesn't mean that you're a bad acupuncturist. It means that you don't have x-ray vision for someone's you know, vascular system. <laughs> so that can happen. Um, but I, what they're really finding now is that we're putting it into these more dense areas of connective tissue. So they're seeing how the connective tissue can come together and in these a little bit of a denser area and then where and then there's a lot of nerve endings in that location so we put the needle in you give it a little bit of a twist and you can feel that tug within the connective tissue and that's going to generate some sort of biochemical message to the brain and so the brain can then respond to that with different chemical messengers as well you can have an immune reaction you can have a nervous system reaction but there's all these different chemical chemical messengers that start to um, be released from the brain to promote healing in the body. So it's not necessarily telling, it's not making the body do something it doesn't want to do. But sometimes these messengers get blocked up. And you may not, and you start to lose your, your sense of the area. So those neural pathways are no longer being stimulated appropriately. And so we need to heighten that stimulant. We have to heighten that sensation. So by putting the needles in, and sometimes we'll add some electrical acupuncture to that as well, we just turn up the volume. So we're heightening that sensation. We're heightening that message. We were talking about Rob's shoulder earlier. And sometimes when you're not getting that message anymore, you're, getting, you're so used to it. You're so far in with your shoulder that your body no longer knows to heal it. Absolutely. And I'm, I'm sitting here thinking the exact same thing when you're talking about this is, my body just kind of encapsulated it and said, okay, whatever, we're just going to live with it. And yep. it's not healing itself. It's not healing itself. So it's really not about what acupuncture is going to go do to you because we're not putting anything into the body. We're giving the body space and turning up the volume to do what it already wants to do. So it's really supporting and empowering the body in its natural homeostasis. You know, I've worked with a couple acupuncturists in the past, and one thing I notice is that they have different um, 
I won't say rituals around how they handle the needles, how they place the needles, uh-huh. the time you spend with the needles inside you. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? Because it's different from these different practitioners. I didn't know if there was a certain style uh, in the way they were trained, or is uh-huh. there some rationale behind that? So one of my very wise teachers said to me, and this is when we were in Santa Cruz, that there are many ways to get to San Francisco. <laughs> so when you're in Santa Cruz, you can take Highway 1, you can go over 17 to take 280. You can also go over 17 to take 101. And she said, doesn't really matter how you get there, it's just as long as you get to San Francisco. So there, that's the real profound thing about medicine these days, right? Is that there, you know, you can look for the, you know, one thing that probably has the most clinical evidence behind it. But really, is that the true path? And is that the only path to get there? And what we found is that the answer is no, right? So there's no real fixed path for acupuncture either. There are many masters out there. It, you know, acupuncture has been influenced, and, you know, it was rooted in China, but then it's been, you know, the Japanese have taken on acupuncture. The Koreans have used acupuncture. Um, there's forms in Vietnam. It goes all over Asia. And then even in Tibet, they use needles to an extent. But is there any wrong way with doing it? Is one really better than the other? Not really. I think it's really about finding what's going to work for that patient. And oftentimes, same thing. It's like if you... Does every patient need to have 20 minutes of needle retention? No, because not everybody responds in the same way. Some people drop down right away. In the clinic, what I mean by drop down is that their nervous system relaxes right away. They go into parasympathetic quickly. And so they don't they don't need that much time on the table. Or maybe they can they want more time on the table because they're so relaxed. And then you have the person who we can say has poor vagal tone can't go into their parasympathetic very quickly and they're agitated and maybe they're resistant. So they may like, I give everyone a buzzer, but they may hit their buzzer in 10 minutes and say, I'm done because maybe they're resistant of going there or maybe they're in too much pain. But does that mean that we're, that there's no benefit to what it is that we're doing? It's really difficult to say. So I don't really have like a straight answer for that. Sure, sure. I like the San Francisco analogy. That was pretty clear. <laughs> <laughs> right. There's lots of ways to go about doing things. I just found it curious because there is sort of this, a little bit of a mystery school around uh, acupuncture. And when I worked with uh, traditionally trained uh, Chinese medical clinicians, um, there was a little bit of, I'd call voodoo or sense of, wow, what is he picking up on here that I'm not, you know, intuiting with my mm-hmm. Anglo vision? <laughs> so, yes. um, and a lot of it had to do with just changes in tone of the tissue, uh, color changes, changes in heat, obviously, uh, you know, vagal tonicity. Um, it's just curious to me as to why people were doing it so differently, but very clearly stated, um, lots of ways to get the healing done uh, when you start to wake up or you know, get the body working on its own behalf. Yeah, I think that I really just encourage patients to find someone that they feel comfortable working with. I think that if you go in and the, you know, you're turned off immediately, even just by the aesthetic of a room, that that already turns your journey off. Absolutely. Right? To a certain way. But if you walk into a space and the aesthetic is right for you and the smells are right and the sounds are right, and that's half the journey. Right. And so, you know, you're going to have a better experience there. So that gives you their confidence. I'm not saying that is placebo, but I'm just saying that there's a lot to account for when it comes to creating a healing environment. But also you can go back into the traditions is what, what I experienced in, um, in China and at, at when I studied at uh, Zhejiang University is that they don't even care about the environment. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> you know, there's the broom closet. <laughs> no, they, no, it's massive rooms. There are people oh, smoking wow. cigarettes. I mean, you have people butted up right next to each other, and they do strong needling, and they turn up the eastern where people are just, you know, their uh, muscles are convulsing. Convul- yeah, they're just, wow. you know, uncontrollably twitching, and then they have. You know, every needle has moxa burning on it, so they have they do a hot needle technique. And I mean, I felt like I was a little bit, you know, in an in, insane asylum there for half a second, just looking around and taking it back and think to myself, 
there's no way this would fly in the States. There's absolutely no way that you could have a clinic like this in the States because people here want this experience and have a certain idea of what healing feels like to them. But in China, this is true medicine for them. They don't care about the aesthetics. You don't need to convince someone that this is going to work for them. So, you know, it's really about hardcore medicine there. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'd like you to talk a little bit about um, this sort of, uh, I guess it's moxa and cupping and some of these other tools that you guys use mm -hmm. and some of uh, the rationale of why you use them. Mm -hmm. So um, with cupping, for instance, there's different ways of cupping. And so traditionally... Uh, cupping can be done by uh, with a glass cup. And so the way that you would get the suction from it is it's called fire cupping. So you would light a cotton ball on fire. You put some alcohol in the cotton ball, and I usually use a hemostat. And then you put the, the lit cotton ball inside the cup. You pull the oxygen out, and so it creates a natural vacuum, and then you place it over the person's body. So there's multiple ways where you can like move the cups and glide them, or you can just leave them stationary. These days, you have hand pump cups as well, so it's more of a manual technique. With those, you can get uh, you know better control over the suction, and then they make them so that they're plastic, so that way you can do mobility work with that. That would be great for your shoulders to get some range of motion going while you have the cup. So it's a little bit like an active release therapy. Um, the way that we used it in Chinese medicine, there's also wet cupping. And wet cupping it sounds a little barbaric, but it's incredibly effective for uh, tissue like hematomas or whether where we call it, where we say there's a lot of uh, deep level blood stagnation. So they may either lance. The area and then put the cup on top where it would draw blood out or you can also use what we call a seven star hammer needle and so it has seven lancets with a little plastic handle and you break the skin and the area open and then you add the cups on top of that so it really draws that old blood out of the area now the idea of that is that if you're drawing that old blood out of the area what is it going to do Bring in fresh blood. It's going to bring yeah. in flesh blood. It's going to create an immune response, right? And it's also going to get that cardiovascular system moving. And, and nutrients. And nutrients bring it into the area so that you can promote healing. The cupping is also working with lengthening out that connective tissue. So it's also when you lengthen that the connective tissue, you're going to get more, more mobility into the area as well. And then we also often use it for um, acute... Uh, what we call exterior conditions. So exterior condition, exterior conditions can be pathogenic. So viruses and bacteria. So it's great for pneumonia. It really clears the lungs. So we say it clears heat and toxins out. But again, you're looking at immune response, right? And then it also does thing. Um, so I'll, I'll often use it to help to uh, support someone's immune system. It's amazing on children. So children with bronchitis, chronic cough, allergies, it's really gentle. So it doesn't have to be this hardcore technique where everyone gets left with those cupping marks that you see <laughs> yeah. on all the Olympians, but it could be a very gentle technique for kids as well. Gua sha is very kind of similar to cupping, except you're not drawing out necessarily. So you're not, you don't have that suction, but you're using a, oftentimes it's done with a Chinese soup spoon or uh, I think in Vietnam, they do it with coins. Mm. So is my, that the scraping? Yeah, the like scraping. Mm -hmm. And, uh, or they have horns. So they have animal horns that you can use and scrape along the tissue. And what that does, same thing, you're just breaking up what we call blood stagnation and bringing in new blood to the area. But when you do it over an area that's been really uh, lacking appropriate circulation and flow, you'll really see the marks come up quickly. And then as you continue to do it, it doesn't come up as quickly because you're getting more blood flow into the area. So you can use it diagnostically also. You can tell if a patient is getting better. But oftentimes I'll use, for me, for instance, I'll use gua sha to help to stimulate someone's immune system. So I do it on their upper back. And then um, I often get into more like kind of smaller spots, smaller areas, more specific areas that you can't quite get to. So neck, even over the tendons, it's really helpful as well. The moxibustion, it's a heating tool. So 
it's a way of getting more heat to areas that are more impacted by cold. So, and it's also what we use to tonify and build and nourish the system. But you also have to be careful because you don't, it's heat. So for somebody who is more hot constitutionally, you don't want to do that. So when we look at arthritis, for instance, we look at, it, not all, all arthritis is the same. Now in Western medicine, it's the same thing, right? Not, not all arthritis is the same. You have the hot type arthritis, which is RA. So you have rheumatoid arthritis. And then you have more of a cold type arthritis, which is general osteoarthritis. So those are the patients who are saying, well, you know, I wake up in the morning and I feel really stiff. And then once I get going and I feel warmed up, I feel better. Or when it's really cold outside and it's going to be raining and the barometer changes, I tend to feel more achiness in my joints. And that's what we'll call damp, cold bee pain. So that's a whole other type of arthritis as well. So in those cases, the cold and the damp, the getting heat in there would what to the damp, it'll dry it out. And then getting the heat into the cold will warm it up. So we look at being able to put needles into an area and then adding the mox on top so that it really heats that joint up from a deeper level. So those are, those are at least, at least a little bit of an explanation of how those items work. Sure, sure. Yeah. Um, the other thing was, is I know when some of my colleagues were studying acupuncture um, to sort of add it on to their you know, therapies that they were doing, that they really used these meridians um, as sort of a maps. Mm -hmm. And they would use these little dummies. In fact, we have a little meridian dummy in our office uh, that we can refer to when people have questions about this sort of stuff. And we have one for the teeth. And um, so it's pretty curious. But in your mind after you do this i know it's just like when i took anatomy as a first year medical student it was like overwhelming but like now i know where the stuff is you know so yeah. how is it now for you when you think about where you're going to place a needle and what the impact you think it's going to have what's that like for you now is it more intuitive or is it like i just know this right i think after i mean i've been handling needles i mean after all my training and everything it's been 20 years and it very much becomes an intuitive practice so people will often find, and I think other acupuncturists can attest to that too, is that you really develop a feel for a patient's body. So rarely am I really just stick putting needles in based on point location. A lot of times I'm palpating. And so I'm feeling, and you can feel where there may be an imbalance within the tissue. And that's really where I want to place those needles. And then I use a lot of theory or, you know, really analyzing somebody's constitution. So that way I can pick the placement of those needles uh, to find the best avenue of treatment for that person. Uh, I do a Japanese style of acupuncture as well. So sometimes I'll test the patient's hara, which is their abdomen. And I'm looking for points of tenderness in these specific locations. And then I'm going to choose points to help to release the hara. And so that's another way of making sure that the treatment that I'm actually doing is going to be effective for that patient. So I just kind of find my way through that. But yeah, it very much becomes intuitive after some time. Oh, that's wonderful. The other thing that um, I've seen within the acupuncture realm is the integration of using herbs. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of times um, when people say, oh, listen, I'm an acupuncturist, and they just assume, oh, she just places needles. But there's so much more that comes with that. I mean, I've seen, you know, looks like a botanical pharmacy in some of these offices with names I could never even pronounce mm -hmm. um, that are being used and integrated with um, the acupuncture. Can you talk a little bit about the herbal aspects of your practice? Yeah, I mean, the herbal aspects really help to reinforce where we're trying to get to with the patient. And so once you discover somebody's constitution, you know, there's different types of formulations. So there's formulations that you can use in an acute situation, and there's also formulations that you use from a chronic situation. So you're looking at someone's constitution or really just trying to manage the symptoms. A lot, oftentimes, you know, the beauty of it is that it's, this is a tradition that's been practiced for thousands of years. There's, I mean, thousands of different types of formulations. And then there's modifications to each formula. And so you can really then gear it towards your patient by just so adding or subtracting a specific herb. Now, when you're looking at it from, in terms of introducing it into the Western model, it gets kind of confusing because, you know, oftentimes there's a lot of negative perception on specific types of herbs. So we'll take Ma Huang, for instance. 
So ephedra or ma huang has often been on the market, off the market, right? <laughs> and there's major concern for ephedra. I mean, ephedra is often used, it was used in Sudafed. Mm -hmm. I think people were extracting it and making what, meth. drugs out of it, yeah. meth out of it. Mm -hmm. And uh, so there's a great concern with people overdosing or who have other chronic conditions that ephedra would be contraindicated in. Now in Chinese medicine, and so, you know, when you look at that, and they say, oh, well, that's a Chinese herb and it's dangerous and we need to take it off the market. In the Chinese, when you understand Chinese medicine, it doesn't make any sense at all. What, because not one acupuncturist would ever prescribe ephedra by itself. It's always used in a combination of different herbs. So you have an herbal formula, the way that it's built is that it's built with these foundational herbs and then they're built with moving herbs and then they're built with herbs that will also direct the herbs to a specific location. So they're incredibly balanced in the way that they're made. So you can, again, add and subtract. The um, level of ma, of ma huang that they would use in a formulation, mostly for respiratory issues, is incredibly low. So that you're not really feeling those effects. And if somebody is concerned and they're feeling those effects, well, then you modify the formula and you can drop that dosage down more. So it's really a beautiful form of medicine. In my practice now, you know, compliance is a major issue with taking herbs and, you know, it's like in, in the tradition, in the traditional perspective, you're going to cook those herbs and, and, you know, put them into a clay pot and add water and cook them down and decoct them and then drink them. Well, I don't know that many patients that would actually do that these days, mm -hmm. <laughs> but it is something that I grew up with. And so in our clinic now, what we try to do is we have some bulk herbs. Most of them are in teas and uh, pills or granules. And so people can are, are a little bit better with their compliance in taking it. Or in their, I don't like to say compliance necessarily, but in their, particip or in their participation of taking it. Um, but now we found ways of being able to bring the tradition back to teach people how to cook broths with it. And so if you add it in as a part of your daily care, where it's just you're drinking it because it's food, then you're really treating yourself through your food. And that's how it should be. Absolutely. Yeah. Food, food is the best medicine. Food is the best medicine. Then I'm not worried about someone's, or I don't want to say compliance, participation, because guess what? They need to eat every day. So I really have kind of turned my practice more into being able to work with patients at where they're at and then slowly being able to support them so that they can um, really participate in their own health care. But yeah, herbs can be used as a part of treatment just to help to reinforce the rest of their condition. How much of your practice do you think is education? I mean, how much are you actually just sitting there bringing people up to speed on self-care? And, you know, because we really talked about, culturally speaking, that you were raised in an environment which was really about promoting health and balance. Um, and respecting this body that we inhabit for mm -hmm. the time we have it. Um, how much time do you really have to spend with folks on that end? I would say about 70%. <laughs> well, that's amazing. Well, that's, that's good to hear, though, because that's, it's such an important issue. I understand that uh, through the practice of medicine myself, it's sometimes challenging to find an ear that can hear what you're saying, listen, integrate, and apply. And I think um, whoever is gifted enough to make those things happen as a teacher or as a clinician um, has some uh, pretty powerful gift to work with. Because so many times I'll have a patient come back and not make any of the changes I recommended or follow any of the suggestions. What has your experience been like? You know, I think that through the years, I you know, I'm in a really small community. And so, you know, word of mouth gets around. And so people kind of get it at this point that they know that they're not going to come in and I don't, I don't work from the, I'm going to fix you model. I don't work in a paternalistic model where I'm going to tell somebody what to do either. I very much partner with my patients. And so, uh, you know, even in Chinese medicine, I can just give someone a formulation and often do people, oftentimes people do come in with different formulas and they say, oh, I've been taking this. And I said, well, how long you've been taking it? And they say, oh, I've been taking it for years, like five, 10 years. And I said, well, okay, well, that's not really how things are supposed to work. I mean, the idea is that it's supposed to 
help to get you somewhere, but your journey is lost because we're not really sure where you are on your journey anymore because our our concept of medicine is a little bit warped. You know, we're just supposed to just take it and that's supposed to keep us healthy rather than like, oh, we're supposed to take it and then our body changes and then we have to assess where we are at now. And then maybe I just don't need that anymore, but I'm not really relying on that to keep me well because I have all these other um, lifestyle tools that I can do to also keep myself well. So my best is I don't really want that many people on that many supplements. I want, I want people to be able to really be their best friend and be their own best advocate by making those choices every day, because I'm not going to be there to guide them. I'm not going to handhold them. So I think that a lot of the patients that have come in to see me at this point understand and kind of know that about me. I kind of joke around and I tell them right away, you know, I'm the meaner <laughs> you know, we have multiple practitioners mm-hmm. in the office mm-hmm. and I was like, you, you know, I'm kind of like the meaner of the two of us, right? Because <laughs> you know? I'm going to tell them the truth, but I'm also going to really work with them at where they're at. Because sometimes people come in and you've seen this, they are so down and out. They're their lowest point in their health and they just need a win. And it's really hard to be able to say to somebody who is incredibly fatigued, who has incredible amounts of pain, who've been traumatized, who are on multiple medications to say, oh, you know what? You just need to eat better and you need to cook food for yourself. It's really hard because they don't have the energy to do it. So that's when the physical medicine comes in. And if we can just start moving their chi just kind of get their body back in balance. And what I mean by moving their chi is to get them out of that stuck position. Then they have the ability of then being able to move forward. So I really love being able to have these different tools because I think that they lend to each other. It's not that one's better than the other, but it gives you that power, not power, but the ability of being able to work with a patient in a multifaceted way. Yeah. Well, you know, it's funny, Dr. Mackey brought up some of these topics um, when, as an osteopath, dealing with these neuromuscular issues. Mm -hmm. And one of the easiest things that we can do with our hands is to open up those channels for folks and to actually alleviate pain almost immediately. Um, But the concept we looked at was this sort of um, autonomic nervous system response to chronic stress. And so people live in a state of sort of persistent PTSD. And, you know, at the end of the day, when the tiger is at the door, you got three responses. You know, you can fight the tiger, you can flee from the tiger, or you can just fall. You can just collapse, play dead. Yeah. And so a lot of people in our society are really walking dead. They're, they have fallen into like, when there's no more to do. I'm just going to, I'm at the whim and will of the world around me. And I have, you know, really have lost all autonomy. And that's um, where I think we find a lot of our folks. I know certainly in the world of cancer, when people get the diagnosis, and especially when they're at advanced stages, that's exactly how they feel, that there's no options, you know. So by giving them this win that you talk about is critical. It's critical to turn the tide on that mentality, because ultimately a lot of that reality lives there. And they can overcome that with some of these steps. Absolutely. And I really completely 100% agree with you on that. And I can't speak more for the medicine and of, of acupuncture as a tool of being able to help people get there. And uh, I often t- oftentimes I describe to my patients, I joke around, but I say that acupuncture is like the short and dirty version of meditation. <laughs> you know, it's a forced meditation. Mm-hmm. It pins you down. You cannot move and you have to feel your body. And so in the Vipassana tradition of meditation, you sit for an hour, you do not move, and you do not react to your pain. Because they say that it develops your, you start when you start to react to that, that that is what's kind of creating your karmic patterns. And so oftentimes we, we react to everything around us, right? So it's really hard for us to be attuned to our body as a whole. But when you have needles in you, you don't really want to move a whole lot. You know, patients will try to get on their cell phones. They'll try to be answering calls. Sometimes they try to ignore, you know, but they're trying to move around, but then they realize quickly that they can't really move. So I just think I call it the short and dirty version of 
of meditation so that it really drops, it has a really strong uh, parasympathetic effect in the body. That's why people kind of come out and they're always glassy eyed. I always joke, joke around of not driving under the influence of chi. <laughs> That's <laughs> funny. That's awesome. You know, like get grounded before you, you go home because you're, you're taking someone from, you know, that extreme fight or flight down to and dropping them into parasympathetic where they may have not been in a long time. So the experience in their body is so unique that they feel kind of drugged or high or out of it. But that's really, it often does get people coming back. <laughs> I, uh, speaking of that, the with the enormous amount of psychiatric issues right now, that anxiety, depression, PTSD, do, do you help treat that? I mean, I, I'm assuming that it's very treatable with what you do. Absolutely. I'm mean, not licensed. I would never replace working with a behavioral health specialist, mm -hmm. but it can definitely be used in conjunction with that. As support. As support. Absolutely. Because even when you're doing, you know, cognitive behavioral therapy or behavioral health, the big thing these days is being able to work from work with patients through mindfulness. Because our nervous system is a major block. It's like we talked about it. You mentioned it earlier. It's like stress is such an impact on all conditions, right? That if you're looking at a common thread in most chronic health conditions, stress is a part of it. So it's a foundational piece that needs to be addressed. But it's so often that we don't talk about it. It's a little bit uncomfortable, I think, for patients sometimes. And I feel like it's also uncomfortable for providers that not all providers are trained in the ability of working with patients who have been traumatized, but many patients, and I think you can both attest to that, who are chronically ill, have been traumatized in some sort of way, which sets off their nervous system in this fight or flight. And then from there, all these other conditions are arising, right? Absolutely. It sets the stage for that. Yeah. But when we only have 10 minutes of time, in the revolving door of modern day medicine, you're not gonna get into that with a patient. Yeah, you know, and I think that's one reason why we're having these conversations in this forum is that there's gotta be a paradigm shift in healthcare because without that, we are really tossing away a generation of patients. Um, and we do so because we don't hear their stories. Uh, we don't reflect back on those stories and work with them where they need to be worked at. And what we know about our patients over time, from like the 50s until now, we've had monstrous improvement in technology and diagnostics and lab tests, but our ability to connect with a patient has been ruined. Yeah. It has been ruined. The intimacy between a physician and a patient is interrupted so many times that um, it's, it's almost like a, a lost art to have a house call. I mean, I still do house calls. I mean, it's like, wait, somebody do house calls, that's crazy. If you go into someone's house and you spend an hour or two hours with them, the amount that you'll glean from that experience could make a major shift in how the care is given and received. Mm -hmm. And I think that you're right. This 10-minute visit, it's a joke. I mean, it's, it's sort of this acute ambulatory care style of medicine that's about one thing, and that's about supporting the business of medicine, which is uh, monetarily driven. Yes, you know. absolutely. And that's really infiltrating its way in a lot of holistic care as well. You know, there is the the positive and the negative sides of people's insurance now covering acupuncture, for instance, and more holistic care modalities. You know, it's great because people get excited. Oh, I can use my insurance. But what they don't see is the back end of that. And the back end is that you know, there's insurance companies that are cutting reimbursement rates for acupuncturists to between $25 and $40 a visit. Hmm. Now, the, the, the time that you enjoy with your acupuncturist to spend that 20 to 30 minutes of communication, that hour of time on the table, that starts to get cut short. It starts to become impacted because if patients want to use their insurance, you know, you, you have to, it's, it limits what we have the ability of doing. So we have to see more patient volume. Exactly. And so now this has been, and now it's starting to move into that. So I, it's really difficult because I do want to support my patients. And, and we do, like in my private clinic, we do do some insurance. But really, I think it diminishes the quality of care. And if you're really looking at changing how our care model is, we really need to change the business model of the medical system, which is a huge undertaking. Yeah, yeah. 
And so more and more people, I think one of your questions or your potential questions was like, wh what do I see and how do I see modern medicine or medicine changing in the next however many years? And I really hope that it changes and moves into, so that these people are going to start leaving that system. And I think more and more people you're seeing that you're seeing these boutique clinics, but you, we need to be able to set it up where it's still affordable for patients. But I also think that when patients are paying out of pocket, they're more invested. I see that 100% with patients coming to me. Uh, I'm very fortunate because I've been able to move into this business, uh, or this practice, it's an integrative. And I tell other patients that I see, I'm very happy and lucky because the patients that come see me, A, they're willing to pay for it. B, they're invested in their health. And C, we form a team and we formulate a plan and they usually stick to the plan. Mm -hmm most of the time if it's not absurd but and that's what's really great about it i think uh one of the biggest problems with healthcare is what you guys are talking about is insurance i think that's absolutely destroyed healthcare because what you said you got to see more and more patients more and more patients more and more patients um if you look at all the biggest buildings in all the big cities in the united states what are they they're insurance companies mm -hmm. they're bigger mm -hmm. than banks and it's crazy mm -hmm. and to have someone possibly with maybe a GED in Toledo, Ohio, calling my clinic and saying that, or, you know, well, we, we can't pay for that. It, it's absurd. Right. It's, med it's not medically necessary for, yeah, yeah. <laughs> for a person who's yeah. never seen this Third patient <laughs> to yeah. dictate that this is not medically necessary yeah. is completely off the wall, right? Yeah. It doesn't make any sense. And it really impacts our entire medical model and then our entire healing system and the way that we perceive health. And so I think looking at what is our, what's our purpose here? What's my passion? And my passion is really working with creating a different health culture and really changing that mindset. And where we get stunted with being able to change that is that the people who are making the most money are surgeons. And so it's something that somebody, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I think surgery is probably one, it's one of the big money one makers. Of the big yeah, money sure. makers. I mean, it's, sorry to interrupt you, but it's also one of the big money makers for the hospitals. Right. Hospitals make more money by doing surgery. It's, it's their bread and butter. Right. And so when you're looking at that, that comes again from something outside of you being fixed. Somebody is fixing it for you. So everyone's mentality in terms of the general public or patients are looking for that outside means of fixing themselves. And so that is the same perception with pharmaceuticals. And, and, and uh, you know, I don't want to get into the politics of that. <laughs> but, you know, when you look at how things are driven, why we don't have a good health culture, it's because where all the money is, is outside of the person themselves, outside of the patients themselves and what they can do for themselves. It's not about empowering the patient. It's about convincing them that they need something outside of themselves in order to fix themselves. Now, do we give them any sort of foundation for that? Do we give them any sort of foundation of like, well, how are you sleeping? And well, if you're not sleeping well, are we asking about sleep hygiene? Or are we just prescribing meds to fix it? And so it just lends to the problem. It just continues to drive that same problem. And soon enough, if we stay in that same healthcare model with taking insurance, the people who are going to be left standing are the ones who have those, you know, high revenue generating services. And then everyone else, where are we going to be? Yeah, absolutely. Well, I was going to say the uh, this past week, of course, news came out that uh, they're closing Hahnemann Hospital. So yeah. Hahnemann Hospital is one of the largest facilities in Philadelphia, and uh, you know, six hundred residents, uh, you know, fifteen hundred staff. I mean, it's a massive impact on this. I mean, it's a magnificent and huge campus, um, and it's shutting down because they weren't able to make ends meet based on their current insurance contracts. I mean, there's many layers to this, but at the end of the day, they weren't bringing in enough as they were putting out just simple uh, like household economy and you know when your bills are greater than your revenue there's a problem and if Hahnemann can go away anyone else yeah I mean Hahnemann is one of the oldest hospitals in the country 
named after a very famous homeopath. Right? Homeopathic doctor. <laughs> <laughs> this is true. Yeah. yeah. And it's sad because this is, you know, I, I worked at a hospital that closed, unfortunately, and I was sort of the last captain of the ship before it went down. And um, it's tragic because people will die without access to appropriate health care. And we're seeing that now. And it's really, you know what? we're not going to keep the hospital open because you can't pay your bills or we're not going to reimburse you enough to keep your hospital open. It's very sad. And that's why there is pressure, like you mentioned earlier, for folks to seek care outside of these systems through direct patient care, direct primary care, uh, direct holistic or integrative care um, in an effort to bypass um, this issue, which is the fact that a third party is dictating whether or not you're going to receive X, Y, or Z for care or any care at all. Right. That'd be like going to the Safeway and having someone say, "No, you can't buy that food today. You have to buy this brand." Yeah, it's it's just it's absurd. Yeah, and, and this takes us down into a really deep rabbit hole because we're looking at what is it that's really making us sick, and you know we've we've talked about stress being one of them, and then you know and not having an appropriate health culture, and then food is another major one, you know, and it you know I have to explain to my ten year old why cheap food is readily available, but healthy food is so much more difficult to access, you know, and and why it's wrong to purchase the cheap food, the unhealthy food. I mean, he looks at me and he says, well, mommy, if this food is so bad for me, then why is it here? I mean, that's (laughs) really a difficult thing to explain to like a six-year-old and a 10-year-old, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, I have to go, I'm like trying to not get my politics into this, you know, (laughs) but it's really hard not to. And, but we don't have that support. There's no cultural support for even healthy food because it's, you know, it starts from kids and what they, what we find socially acceptable and what we find acceptable to give our children it is just absolutely mind blowing to me. Yeah, funny thing is, is um, you're you're I mean you're tapping into a, a deep issue because there's a lot of people out there that feel, in general, the state is allowing for this food to be available to the masses in an effort for them to survive mm-hmm. on the revenues they're given for the jobs they do within our society. And so when you look at it from a global perspective, it's kind of, hey, we're giving you this stuff at a decent price. You can eat it and consume it. Eh, it may give you cancer. It may lead to diabetes and heart disease and hypertension. But at the end of the day, at least you're eating. Yeah, and um, it's cheap. Right. Yeah, and it's cheap. You can afford it. And, and we're, you know, and in, in the same sad side of the coin, is is that you know in medical school I get like six hours of nutritional education you know postgraduate I've probably done a thousand hours in nutritional education um, above and beyond the little pittance I got in medical school and my medical school did a pretty decent job with it I know some people it's a one-hour course I got zero yeah, so oh. it's it's pathetic, Yeah, you know? And so, I mean, really, you're lucky. If you come out of medical school and you know what a protein is, you know what a carbohydrate is, and you know what a lipid is, <laughs> then you're good to go, <laughs> you know? And at the end of the day, there's so much more to nutrition that people, it's, it, the concept of it is just really lost on a lot of clinicians. And so even to have an educated conversation with your doctor about nutrition, it's, it's scary. Right. I, I mean, I've had patients come from their oncologist and say, they said I could eat whatever I want. They said I should just be happy. I can have desserts and I can have sweets and all sorts of stuff. I just need to keep my weight on. And I thought to myself, how ignorant, how ignorant. I mean, we have now strong data to suggest that this is a metabolically driven disease and that if you're going to eat pure sugar, mm-hmm. that your chances of having a progressive cancer, it's greater. I mean, you're feeding cancer directly in many cases. I mean, we have different you know, types of cancer doing different things. But at the end of the day, I mean, I, there's no literature out there that says sugar is is absolutely great for cancer. Right. There's not <laughs> for anything. I know. I mean, <laughs> like, really. Yeah. I mean, you know, when you look at these pro-inflammatory products that we put into our body, you wonder why we're so sick and and so sick at such a young age. Yeah. yeah. You know, and yeah. obesity is just crazy. Oh, it's crazy, yeah. and that's why you know coming back again to having the traditional Chinese foundation, and even and I'm not I'm not saying that my health is perfect or my foundation is perfect or but there is and you know there's so much influence now coming in from you know different cultures and from developing countries into china and how that's changed now too but if you look into you know there's like we already know number one like there's no perfect diet right i mean sure like it could be clinical evidence again like like you're looking at more clinical evidence towards this diet for this specific condition but we don't really know we have no idea. But 
looking at the foundation from that I've learned from traditional Chinese medicine and Taoism is that we need to live close to nature. And nature is rarely wrong. And so if we know that we're a part of we're natural beings, then we should be putting things in our body that come from nature. And that nature has a way of creating balance. And so when you look at that symbol from Taoism of the yin, the yang, you're looking for that middle place. And you have these Taoist masters that can, you know, everybody, anti-aging medicine is a big one these days. And everyone's trying to, you know, live longer and live more healthy and live a long life and not show it. And, you know, there's a lot of interventions that you could do to correct that. But there's also a lot of just self-care that you can do to manage that as well. And so the Taoist masters say that if you live in balance with nature and in moderation, that you can have longevity in your life. And it's very simple. But I had said to you guys earlier, there's, you know, our culture in the States tends to work in extremes. So even we could take something very healthy and move it to this extreme of, you know, like if I'm going to exercise, well, then I'm going to go to this extreme of over exercising or really pumping up my adrenaline all the time. So then that becomes, you know, people become injured and they are in a chronic state of inflammation. They don't know how to relax because it's about doing more. So again, we got our nervous system involved. We're just, you know, in a hypervigilant state all the time. And we, there's no balance to that. You have to also still refuel your resources, but we don't promote that. It's about how much you can do in a short period of time in the day, or you're not doing enough, and how busy are you really? And we all stake our value around right. that. Shame on pride. you. Shame, shame, shame. <laughs> yeah. You know, you're not doing enough. You're right? not doing mm-hmm. enough. And then you can go to these extremes of eating too healthy and too clean, and then it becomes orthorexic, and you can have body dysmorphia with it. neurotic. And neurotic and OCD. And so even healthy things can then go to these extreme places. And then you can go to the complete opposite side, right, of just giving up completely (laughs) and having no movement, right? It seems like a lot of people in this country have just given up. You know, when I'm making rounds at the hospital, it seems like people have just given up. Yeah. Um, and it's really sad. You know, you're talking about um, how we're so far from nature. Like the, yesterday, I went outside and stood barefoot on the grass out back for 10, 15 minutes just to ground myself again. Because, I mean, look at these little kids. There's probably so many little kids out there that don't run around barefoot outside. They don't actually touch the ground with their feet. And, you know, even simple things like just grounding back to nature and back to the earth has been proven beneficial. Mm-hmm. We're very cut off from that. And so, you know, there's like the simple foundational things. And so, you know, I think it was, you know, Siddhartha who sat under the tree and he gained insight from just observing the nature around him. And if we can take one, two minutes, two minutes of time, two minutes of our time out in the day to, to just do that, you can reconnect with not only nature, but also yourself. But we ignore ourselves. We, we There's so few of us who really have that opportunity to just to check in with how am I doing today? And, you know, I think that women are highly impacted by that because women are, you know, today, same thing. It's like we're promoted to do more, have children, be incredibly successful, be a mom, be a wife, be a business owner and do it all. And if you're not, there's something wrong with you. Instead of, hey, you know what, put your oxygen mask on first and you're not going to be any good to anybody else if you're not taking care of yourself first. And that's a hard lesson to learn. And I'm, t- I'm learning it every day. It's why I chose to do what it is that I'm doing today is because I have, I have to be my best patient. And sometimes I'm not very good at it. I take on way too much. I know my personality and I know my personality is to say yes and take on more. And it's exciting to me and I like it and it feels good. But I've also experienced burnout and wearing myself down. So I have to go back and reformulate these tools constantly of, you know, I I hate it when somebody tells me to carve out more time for myself and to relax. 
That drives me a trigger. crazy. That is a major <laughs> trigger for me because I'm like, guess what? There's not much more time yeah. that I have in the day. So what I've done now is I've developed tools for people of, hey, you know what? Maybe you just don't, you may not have that time during the day for yourself, but maybe you can just go through your day more relaxed. So if you're driving somewhere and you're breathing, you don't have to be driving and holding your breath to get there. And so one of the exercises I get people to do is I tell them to breathe and do dishes. Like just breathe and do dishes because you know what that means? It means that you're relaxed in your nervous system and you're being productive at the same time. Yeah. So why can't we just do that? Guilt-free relaxation. It is. It's simple, right? <laughs> so there's a good segue. What, what is your best medicine for yourself and what do you do for self-care? Well, that's a big part of it. I mean, I, yeah. I mean, I think that of just trying to check in with myself during the day. I'm really incredibly fortunate, and I know that I'm fortunate that I got to. I have. I've been able to choose and go into a profession that I'm really passionate about. So it's actually quite relaxing when I go in with my patients, because it's an enjoyable space. It's a relaxing environment. I feel guilty for my husband sometimes because he's a contractor. So we're on the phone, and I have water of fountains and soft music in my background and I can hear drills and nail guns going off for him. I'm like, I'm so sorry. I'm, <laughs> I'm in my serene environment right now. But working for me is very relaxing. Um, but routine is really important for me. I, I'm not one of those people who obsesses about exercise and I hate going to the gym. But if I establish it as a part of my daily routine and I schedule it, then I know that I'll show up and I'll do it. But the routine, simple routines of going to bed by a certain time every night, waking up around the same time every day, and then setting that time so I can have breakfast and set myself up to have a good day is really important for me. And I'm fortunate to have two wonderful children. And they're incredibly challenging. Raising kids is incredibly challenging, too. But it constantly makes me check in with myself again of like, what kind of example am I setting for my children? And I'm not always going to be the best, right? I'm not always going to be my best self, but they're going to be my motivation piece for that. And sometimes people need a little bit of outside motivation. So I, I always remind people, I'm like, okay, if you can't do it for you because you're a giver, then do it for somebody else, Right. And so for me, I have to remind myself of that. I'm a giver. I need to make sure that I'm going to set a good example for my kids. And so I don't want to be worn out and tired and grumpy when I get home and not have space for them. But they are part of some of my best medicine for me. And just being able to enjoy and play with them. That, that, you said something. Um, I think gratitude is a really good self-care to remind yourself how lucky you are and you said you're lucky that you have a great job i feel the same way when i go into the clinic i'm not stressed i love my job and i'm I'm grateful it's it's the most rewarding job i've had in medicine ever and i sit there and i talk to people and i i play nice music on my computer and it's relaxing um i think and gratitude a lot of people aren't grateful because they don't really look at it and say, oh, my, I'm so lucky I get to do this today. Or I, I'm lucky I live in the United States. I'm lucky I have a car to drive to work. I mean, just simple things. Um, you being in South Lake, do you get, uh, it's a spectacularly beautiful location. Do you get outdoors a lot? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we, we try to as much as we can. I, right now I'm in a place where I'm working a lot, but it's so easily accessible that you know, it, it's hard to avoid nature <laughs> right. from where we are. Yeah. And that was very intentional. I didn't just end up, I grew up in the Bay Area and uh, it was very intentional moving to South Lake because I knew that I wanted to put my lifestyle as a priority. And so being able to get outside and play and raising my kids in an environment where they learn to play and put enjoyment and put their passions as primary it, you know, as a foundation for just happiness for them is really important for me. And so, uh, you know, moving to South Lake was not just like, oh, I just ended up there and I just landed there. It was very much about reinforcing my passion for the outdoors. And we spent some time, it's amazing. I can't, 
I, I feel, again, I'm like gloating on just how amazing it is to be able to raise kids in this type of environment. I mean, they're amazing skiers. And, you know, my 10-year-old officially this year is out skiing me. Nice. So he's officially gone past my ability of skiing, wow. where I look down this cliff and there's no way that I'm going off of this thing. And he just looks at me and yells out, dropping! And there he goes, just <laughs> dives right in. And I have to look for a different way in to follow him. <laughs> That's awesome. So it's so cool. And and I think that, again, like, you know, setting myself up, setting my life up so that I'm playing with my kids. I don't want to be a sideline parent and not being active and getting them outside. We rock climb as a family. We, my husband's from Southern California. He's really passionate about surfing. We've all picked up surfing. I'm, I love surfing. There is hopefully a time where I'll be closer to the ocean and living near the ocean. But it is the best feeling in the world when we are all out in the water together. I bet. I, I mean, it's like it cannot possibly, you cannot be some more submerged in nature than being in the ocean mm. like that. I mean, four hours can go by so quickly. <laughs> Oh, that's amazing. I think what you're reflecting, at least for our listeners and viewers now, is somebody who's got their head screwed on pretty straight. Because at the end of the day, we're not here to work and while away our lives uh, in some big industrial complex, you know, making ends meet. But it's to have, you know, a loving, experiential uh, family environment in which you can embrace all aspects of life in a very healthy and vibrant way. So I'm proud of you for doing that. Thank you so much. I mean, if anything, I think having an intentional life is incredibly profound. And again, I'm feeling very fortunate that I have, that I've been able to manifest and work towards the intentions of what I've set forth as being a priority for my life. And I know that not everybody can see that for themselves, but I think that if people can Make, you know, set one intention so that they feel like they're a part of the decision making in their life, that that brings power back to them. So even if it's a little bit of power over not eating that chocolate bar as snack when you're really hungry, that's a win. Yeah, right? absolutely. Even if it's that intention of making sure that you're taking that break at work so you can go outside and just breathe a little bit, that's another win. It doesn't have to be as mass, large scale, I'm gonna overhaul my entire life, you know, because that's incredibly overwhelming for most people. That, it, But if you can just have one little thing that you can do, or maybe even one sentence that you can say to yourself in the morning that's positive, so that way you can go on and feel good about yourself for the rest of the day, that you've done something for yourself. But I think that most people, many people, go about their day unintentionally. Mm. Absolutely. And then they get lost in that. And then their health gets lost in that. Yeah. And then it just continues to spiral down. Sure. Yeah. I, th I think a lot of people have, <clears throat> excuse me, um, they feel like they've lost control of their life. Um, they're just kind of adrift in the sea and doing what they have to do to work, to pay the bills, to yada, yada, yada. And, but if you have, if you try to take a little bit of control. Um, I often tell my patients that diets fail, but lifestyles don't. Mm -hmm. And so when you make that choice, like you said about don't eat that candy bar, that's a win and that's control. You actually made a choice to have some control of your life. And that's really, it, it, it empowers people. I think people feel really unempowered right now. Yeah. And so I think that that's contributing to a lot of the anxiety, depression, and bad things we're seeing yeah. so well i'm very excited to be a part of i think this is a part of the intention of this podcast that you're putting together is to be able to create that platform so that you know we are we're setting we're setting a, a different you know uh goals and intentions around how we work with patients and so that again giving the power back to them and really, I think when that starts to happen and people are demanding a different way that they want to be treated, then we can, then the rest of the medical model and the things that we're combating can start to shift with that. And that's what the hope is, right? I, I hope so. Yeah, absolutely. Any uh, last pearls of wisdom 
medical wisdom, Chinese traditional Chinese medicine, acupuncture, anything that you would like to leave with our listeners and viewers? I think if anything, it's that one piece. I mean, well, there's two pieces. One is being your own best friend and really em- embracing who you are because you're important. And I think that if that is, you know, if people can really look at, you know, the traumas in their lives as a part of their own healing, and it's a part of what makes them unique and that it can actually be turned into a power piece for themselves, that it can really set their lives in a different, into a different direction. And the second piece is about finding what moderation means and looking at the wisdom of these ancient masters who have, you know, very profound things to say, but also very simple things to say, because that's very simple. You can look at how do I moderate my life to come into the middle? Because if I'm going to work this hard, well, then that means I also have to recover. So if you can find a place of being able to do the things that you love, but then also giving yourself space to refuel and your bucket and your resources, that is that moderate place. And then you can live a good, healthy, natural life. That's, that's wisdom. Yeah, absolutely. It's wow. fantastic. Well, thank you so much for coming down uh, today and spending uh, this hour or so with us. And uh, I I would love to see you back here, and I'd love to talk more in detail about some of the good work that you're doing up at the lake. Thank you so much. I would love that. I'm I'm very grateful to have spent the last hour sitting here with you. Thank you so much. I appreciate the opportunity. And so, uh, Melinda, how do people go ahead and get a hold of you up at your clinic? So uh, we have a website, and it's elevate-wellness.com. And then they can, our phone number is 530-541-WELL or 9355. So it's 541-9355. And we have an amazing group of practitioners with us. So Kirsten's with us. Kirsten, Dr. Kirsten Mackey practices out of Elevate two, day, two Saturdays a month. So she drives down from Truckee. And then we also have an amazing naturopathic physician, licensed midwife, herbalist, various body workers, somatic experiencing provider, nutritionist. I mean, we have a whole array of amazing providers at our clinic. And so we're really about elevating the patient to their best selves and really empowering people so that they really take their health back into their own hands. That's great. Can't wait to come visit. Thank you so much. Wonderful. Well, thank you everyone for listening to the Medicine Wheel. This is Dr. Sean Devlin with Dr. Robert Floyd. Uh, Please uh, make sure you give comment uh, on our video and our uh, podcast today, and we look forward to seeing you into the future. Namaste. Peace. The Medicine Wheel encourages all of our listeners to subscribe to our newsletter and podcasts as we continue to explore the world of medicine, bringing you up-to-date health and science information. The Medicine Wheel invites our listeners to email us any newsworthy stories or topics they wish to explore further and discuss on the podcast. For more information about The Medicine Wheel, please visit us at our website, www themedicinewheel.org and on Facebook and finally on Twitter and Instagram at The Med Wheel. In an effort to support access to integrative medicine and functional medicine options for those in need and education for those who need information, please consider donating to Project Omcare 501c3 org. Please go to our website www.themedicinewheel.org to learn more. Thank you again to all our local sponsors, Grateful Gardens, Lighthouse Coffee, and Dorinda's Chocolates, which represent some of the best organic and appetizing options in the Reno Tahoe area. Lighthouse Coffee Shop is a proud sponsor of the Medicine Wheel. We are a family owned and operated local coffee shop. Our goal as a business and a family is to cultivate community wherever we are. All of our coffee is ethically sourced organic and farm fresh. It's roasted in-house daily, guaranteeing you access to the freshest cup of coffee on the planet. We care deeply for our community 
and everyone in it, we strive to provide you with the best ingredients and most comfortable environment. Come and enjoy coffee with us. We are family, and we would love for you to be part of it. Gerber Medical Clinic is proud to support the Medicine Wheel and medical education to improve health quality, nurturing the lifestyles of our listening community, enhancing wellness for all. Thanks again to Wired Insights and their talented team for making our podcasting dream possible. In closing, we would like to remind all of our listeners, if you have a medical concern or diagnosis, you need to see your personal doctor without delay, and if needed, obtain a referral to a specialist. If ever you feel the health issue you have is urgent or an emergency, please call 911 and go to your nearest emergency room. Please do not take any of our physician's commentary or our guest's opinion as medical advice, and always seek out medical care from fully licensed and appropriately trained medical professionals in your area. The information shared in this podcast is for general information only and should not be construed as medical advice and understand that no doctor-patient relationship is formed. The use of this information and educational materials linked to this podcast and website are employed at the user's own risk. The content of this podcast is not meant to be used as a substitute for medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. This is the Medicine Wheel signing off for this week with a reminder to live, love, listen, and learn.